live in interesting times. Today's stories. Venezuela vows full cooperation with a new UN rights chief. Catalan leader tells the Spanish government to stop the threats. The White House says North Korea is showing commitment to conversations with the U.S. U.S.-backed forces launch assault on IS in eastern Syria. U.S. threatens to arrest ICC judges who probe war crimes. Plus, Arizona remembers 9-11. Hello everyone, I am Sarah Nachman bringing you stories from around the globe. And this is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Venezuela's foreign minister hailed Tuesday the arrival of new UN rights chief Michelle Bachelet, following a thorny relationship with her predecessor, vowing his country would cooperate fully with her. In an address to the UN Human Rights Council, Jorge Ariaza vehemently criticized the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, Saeed Raad Al Hussein, who repeatedly raised concerns about serious rights abuses in Venezuela. Ariaza said, we reject the reports of the outgoing High Commissioner for Human Rights. These have been reports that are always biased. They are always against Venezuela. They have always put forward a political personal position. But he hailed Saeed's successor, a former Chilean president, who took the reins of the UN Rights Office just over a week ago. Cuente el Consejo de Derechos Humanos, cuente la Alta Comisionada con toda la colaboración del gobierno de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela y del presidente Nicolás Maduro. Pasamos la página en cuanto a los últimos cuatro años. La economía venezolana en esta situación difícil, de dificultad, de bloqueo, como la cubana durante tantos años, bueno, ha, ha tenido consecuencias. Y por supuesto que hay una migración nueva, pero no es una crisis migratoria. Es una coyuntura. Son venezolanos que se han ido por razones económicas, no por razones políticas, que están buscando una vida mejor. Por cierto, estamos en un programa de retorno de esos venezolanos. Solo en una semana. He said his country will move on as regards to the last four years with respect to the outgoing High Commissioner. Venezuela's announcement that it will cooperate with the UN Rights Office marks a clear about face after it had long denied access to the country by UN Rights Monitors. Asked by journalist Tuesday if he planned to invite Bachelet herself in Venezuela, Ariasa said the time will come, but stressed that first work needed to be done to rebuild trust between his country and the rights office. Nosotros respetamos y queremos a la presidenta Bachelet, primera mujer democráticamente elegida como presidenta en América Latina, es un orgullo para todos. Eh, al mismo tiempo respetamos su criterio, respetamos la independencia de la figura de la alta comisionada, respetamos su mandato y hemos comenzado una etapa de cooperación nueva. During the last session of the Rights Council in June, Saeed had called for an international investigation of atrocities in Venezuela, blasting the government's chronic refusal to probe security officers over the alleged killings of civilians. He asked in vain for the council to set up its highest level probe, a commission of inquiry, for Venezuela and said the International Criminal Court may need to get further involved. His call came after a report by his office based on remote monitoring suggested that officers who had supposedly been tasked with fighting crime may have been responsible for more than 500 killings between July 2015 and March 2017, largely carried out in poor neighborhoods. In a longer written version of her maiden speech as Rights Chief Monday, Bachelet said that since the June report, her office had continued to receive information on violations of social and economic rights, such as cases of deaths related to malnutrition or preventable diseases, as well as violations of civil and political rights. She lamented that government has not shown openness for genuine accountability measures. Um, and in her comments yesterday, um, uh, our high commission, our new high commissioner, uh, Michelle Bachelet, um, also spoke about the you know serious human rights issues in Venezuela, um, and she has called for the uh, Human Rights Council to take all available measures um, to address the human rights violations which have been documented uh, in recent reports. 
um, of course, we are always open to engagement. Uh, we are always open to cooperation, always open to give advice and technical assistance um, to facilitate the ability of governments to um, comply with their international human rights obligations. Catalan President Quim Torra addresses journalists in Barcelona for the Catalan Diada, Catalonia's National Day, sending a message to the Spanish government to stop the threats. ¿Cuántas semanas políticos españoles nos piden que por hablar, por defender nuestras ideas, ya se nos aplique el artículo 155 y que ya casi se nos envíe directamente a prisión? Es que basta de amenazas, basta de amenazas. Es que además, y pienso que la diada de hoy va, 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 va por ahí, va a enviar un mensaje de decir, oiga, es que no tenemos miedo, no tenemos miedo, basta de amenazas, vamos a hablar, vamos a sentar. Es decir, muy bien, esa solución, ¿cuál puede ser? Pues un referéndum pactado, vinculado y reconocido internacionalmente. Ahí la vemos. Y hay un 80% de catalanes que la ve, porque le aplicamos la ley. Pero ya, aplicar la ley es enviar policías a golpear a ciudadanos y a retirar urnas y a secuestrar votos. ¿Esto es aplicar la ley? Aplicar la ley es, eh, ante un proceso impecablemente democrático y pacífico, enviar a la gente a la prisión, mantener gente a la prisión. Pero si Alemania los ha liberado... Pero si en Bélgica están libres, si en Escocia están libres. O sea, ¿Qué está pasando con la justicia española? ¿no? Respecto. Bueno, que sí se están creando las condiciones para que el rol de Europa sea, acabe siendo determinante. Determinante para el diálogo, no determinante a favor de la independencia de Cataluña, que nadie está solicitando esto, pero sí determinante para que los ciudadanos catalanes podamos acabar obteniendo un, en el diálogo con el Estado español un escenario de decisión democrática aceptable para ambas partes. Y es lo que... Catalan separatists prepared to put on a show of strength and unity at celebration of Catalonia's National Day Tuesday, nearly a year after a failed attempt to break away from Spain. The annual Diada holiday, which commemorates Barcelona's fall to troops loyal to Spain's King Philip V in 1714, has since 2012 been used to stage a massive rally calling for secession for the wealthy northeastern region with its own distinct language. But this year's event will have particular significance as a test of strength after a referendum last October 1 and the Catalan Parliament's unilateral declaration of independence on October 27 all came to naught. Thousands of people strolled through the streets of central Barcelona ahead of the start of the demonstration at 1714, a nod to the year 1714. Many wore the Catalonia separatist flag with its yellow and red stripes, blue triangle and white star, draped around their shoulders or as a scarf. Organizers say at least 460,000 people signed up for the rally, which a million people attended last year. Many could still join the march without signing up. Up next, the White House says North Korea is showing commitment to conversations with the U.S. U.S.-backed forces launch assault on IS in eastern Syria. U.S. threatens to arrest ICC judges who probe war crimes. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will return to Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says North Korea is showing a commitment to continuing conversations with the U.S. following Kim Jong-un's letter to President Trump about second meeting. U.S. President Donald Trump has received a very positive letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un seeking a follow-up meeting after their historic summit in Singapore, the White House said Monday. White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders said it was a very warm, very positive letter, adding that the message showed Pyongyang's continued commitment to focus on denuclearization on the Korean peninsula. She said the primary purpose of the letter was to schedule another meeting with the president, which are open to and are already in the process of coordinating. Sanders added that the letter was further evidence of progress in Washington's relationship with Pyongyang. Trump and Kim held a historic summit in Singapore in June that raised prospects of a breakthrough on curtailing North Korea's nuclear program. 
This might follow on negotiations on denuclearizing the peninsula hitting a snag, leading to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo canceling a planned trip to the north late last month. The new letter showed signs that the discussion remained alive after weeks of apparent deadlock. The White House has pointed to a series of accomplishments in recent months, including a release of U.S. hostages, the repatriation of war remains believed to be U.S. service members, and a pause in North Korea's missile and nuclear test to suggest progress between the foes. And on Sunday, North Korea refrained from displaying its intercontinental missiles, long a bone of contention in its nuclear tensions with Washington, in a massive parade through Pyongyang celebrating the country's 70th birthday. Um, the most recent parade this weekend, one of the uh, first times, I believe, that we have, they have had a uh, parade similar where they weren't highlighting their nuclear arsenal. We consider that a sign of good faith. And again, uh, the letter from uh, Kim Jong-un to the president certainly showed a commitment to continuing conversations. Trump thanked Kim for the gesture, saying on Twitter, this is a big and very positive statement from North Korea. The letter's arrival was confirmed as Trump's top security advisor said the White House was looking to North Korea for next steps. Sanders also answered questions about Bob Woodward's scathing new book and the U.S. decision to sanction ICC judges. And a number of people have come out and said that Woodward never even reached out to corroborate statements that were attributed to them, uh, which seems uh, incredibly reckless for a book to make such outrageous claims to not even take the time to get a $10 fact checker to call around and verify that some of these quotes were happening. A commander and a war monitor said U.S. backed fighters launched a fierce assault Monday against a dwindling pocket of territory held by the Islamic State group in East Syria. The Syrian Democratic Forces, an alliance of Kurdish and Arab fighters, have been closing in for months on the town of Hajin in eastern Da'ir Azur province. On Monday, they began an offensive for the IS-held town itself. <laughs> An SDF commander said the assault, relying heavily on artillery and U.S.-led coalition airstrikes, had killed at least 15 IS fighters. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights Monitor said the IS death toll was at least 17. The Britain-based observatory said the SDF had been amassing fighters and equipment and beefing up their positions for weeks ahead of the attack. Observatory head Rami Abdel Rahman said the operation to end Daesh presence in this pocket began today, with the heaviest airstrikes, artillery fire, and ground attacks in months by the SDF and coalition. He said the SDF had broken into Hajin from its northwestern edge and taken control of part of the area, while opening a humanitarian corridor to allow residents to flee. IS declared a self-styled caliphate in 2014 across swath of Syria and Iraq, but various separate offensives by the national armies of both countries, Kurdish forces, and international backers have seen the jihadist territory shrink dramatically. In Syria, IS controls part of the Ir Azur as well as some territory in the south. The SDF, founded in October 2015, has been backed by U.S.-led coalition airstrikes, artillery, and special forces advisors.
It ousted IS from swaths of Syria's north last year, including from their main bastion, Raqqa. In Dair Azur, the SDF is battling IS on the eastern side of the Euphrates River that cuts through the province, while Syrian regime troops backed by Russian battle them west of the river. In July, a coalition official said a few hundred IS fighters remain in the eastern pocket. In a purported new audio recording released on August 22nd, IS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi remained defiant. He said, the caliphate will remain. IS is not confined to Hajin. On Monday, coalition spokesman Sean Ryan said IS still held an estimated 1,000 square kilometers, under 400 square miles, in the Euphrates Valley. The United States threatened Monday to arrest and sanction judges and other officials of the International Criminal Court if it moves to charge any American who served in Afghanistan with war crimes. White House National Security Advisor John Bolton called the Hague-based rights body unacceptable and outright dangerous to the United States. Israel and other allies said any probe of U.S. service members would be an utterly unfounded, unjustifiable investigation. Bolton said the U.S. was prepared to slap financial sanctions and criminal charges on officials of the court if they proceed against any Americans. We will ban its judges and prosecutors from entering the United States. We will sanction their funds in the U.S. financial system, and we will prosecute them in the U.S. criminal system. We will do the same for any company or state that assists an ICC investigation of Americans. Bolton made the comments in a speech in Washington to the Federalist Society, a powerful association of legal conservatives. Bolton pointed to an ICC prosecutor's request in November 2017 to open an investigation into alleged war crimes committed by U.S. military and intelligence officials in Afghanistan, especially over the abuse of detainees. Neither Afghanistan nor any other government party to the ICC's Rome Statute has requested an investigation, Bolton said. He said the ICC could formally open the investigation any day now. He also cited a recent move by Palestinian leaders to have Israeli officials prosecuted at the ICC for human rights violations. Bolton said the United States will use any means necessary to protect our citizens and those of our allies from unjust prosecution by this illegitimate court. He said the U.S. will not cooperate with the ICC, will provide no assistance to the ICC, certainly will not join the ICC and will let the ICC die on its own. The condemnation of the ICC added to the White House's rejection of many supranational institutions and treaties the president does not believe benefit the United States. Bolton also condemned the record of the court since it formally started up in 2002 and argued that most major nations had not joined. He said it had attained just eight convictions despite spending more than $1.5 billion and said that had not stemmed atrocities around the world. Bolton said the main objection of the administration of President Donald Trump is to the idea that the ICC could have higher authority than the U.S. Constitution and U.S. sovereignty. He said, in secular terms, we don't recognize any higher authority than the U.S. Constitution. This president will not allow American citizens to be prosecuted by foreign bureaucrats, and he will not allow other nations to dictate our means of self-defense. Coming up, Arizona remembers 9-11. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will return shortly. This is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. I am Sarah Nachman. Although it has been 17 years since the 9-11 terrorist attack in New York City and Washington, D.C., claiming almost 3,000 lives, many still take the time to honor those who fell during the tragedy. In Arizona, remembering the heroism displayed on that tragic September day in 2001 is something they take to heart. Eagle News correspondent Belinda Maglugnog has the story. 
I am here at the Tempe Town Lake where the 15th annual Tempe Healing Fields have been set up to remember the innocent lives that were lost during the 9-11 attacks. Approximately 3,000 flags, each standing 8 feet tall in stunning rows along Tempe Beach Park make up the memorial. Each of the flags are equipped with a personal bio card representing a life lost on 9-11. When this was first created back up in Utah, that's where it started, the man who put it together just wanted to show the enormity of the loss. Simple as that. But when he put the field up, there, a healing process started, and that's what we tapped into, the healing process. And so even out in Arizona, there are a lot of Easterners that come out here, and this becomes a touchstone to them. And they come year after year after year. I've had people come out here for 15 years every year to be a part of this. And I've had people fall to the ground crying and sobbing. And, and, it, it, and for some people that have never talked about this for years, this becomes their first opportunity. So sometimes when we're out here, it's not, it's not being part of the field, it's listening to the stories. It's being an ear to the people that want to talk. And that's one of the things that brings us back every year is just the ability to be able to go out into that field and find somebody's loved one with and for them. This morning through our Facebook page, somebody had emailed a request about a loved one that they have that they lost and he happened to be a firefighter. So I knew based on how we mark the field that those people surround our field. We have r yellow ribbons on the flags in addition to their cards. So I was able to go over there, find that individual's flag, and I took two pictures of it and sent it back to the family so that they can see exactly where that is. So it's just a great experience, right, to be able to help people heal through that process. Depending on which of the four days you visited the healing fields, you could have participated in a 5K run, a free concert, a blood drive, the actual memorial service, and even more. And every year we try to do something different or add to it. When we first started, it was just flags. Now we have the bio cards that talk about the, the victims. We put the boots out there for the, the soldiers. We put out the eight bears for the children that died. We put out the yellow ribbons for the first responders. So every year we try to add to the field and make it different. So everybody, even though they come out for the 10th time, there's something new out here for them to experience. We want it to be a place of healing. We want it to be a place of remembrance. We've got an amazing group of volunteers through several of our local and national exchange clubs that come together and really work together beautifully to make this happen for millions of people. Really this field is not for us adults. Although this is the Pearl Harbor of our generation, it's not for us, it's for future generations, it's for the kids. And so we hope that families will bring their kids to walk through the field. We enlist kids to come out and help us all the time to be a part of this, to read the cards, to understand what they're doing. We're hard-headed to do it for 15 years. We're the second longest running healing field in the nation. So we just won't let go of this idea that we need to teach the kids about our history. Let's head out to the west side of Phoenix, where in the city of Glendale, Ronnie's Cafe is serving free breakfast and lunch to celebrate the coming together of Americans to ward off terrorism on our shores. The reason we're doing this for 9-11 is to uh, remember all the all the lives that we lost in 9-11, especially those fallen heroes, the fire department from New York, they sacrificed their lives to save people. But until the new generation, just to remember that we will never forget. Thank you. A favorite diner cell eatery for many locals, Ronnie's Cafe, is known for large servings of home-cooked comfort food style dishes for breakfast and lunch. When my dad was alive, we used to actually come here on the 911 to make sure we were here for the for the 911 remembrance. And I'm I'm not surprised he does this. My mom and dad were one of uh, Richard and Wendy's first customers when they first the first day they opened, and he's been like uh, family to us, like my brother. Called my dad dad all the time, and. Uh, for my dad's last two birthday parties because our house was too small and a lot of relatives wanted to come to our house for his birthdays and uh, he says no more having it at your house you're going to have it at the restaurant and he pretty much fronted the whole the whole thing i have been here 10 years i think it is so wonderful of my boss is to do this for the community and i'm sure that the community really appreciates it because they appreciate all of the endeavors that went through 9-11. I think it's absolutely amazing that we do it. I think it's a little bit that we can give back to all of our regular customers. It's Customer Appreciation Day. We're all blessed to still be here and still be alive. Well, I feel that we should remember always because we let our guard down, and you should never let your guard down when it comes to protecting.
protecting the country and listen to people when they try to warn you on what's going on. For one, it's a learning. It was a learning experience that we need to be more cautious in what we do and how we let people in to our country and also that everybody be prepared for anything. I would want everyone to be forever grateful for all the firefighters and the people that were involved, all the care and the love, and especially that God was involved with it. I think the main thing that the positive that everybody got out of that is we're all a family. No matter what color your skin is or what race you are, who you believe, you know what I mean? Anything. We were all, we're all Americans. That day we were all Americans. It's, we were one big unit and I wish that we would all go back to that. We forget too soon. And that's why I think, you know, celebrating 9-11, uh, like any other holiday, is to get you to re-remember the tragedy or the festivities, one of the two. You know, we should never forget because history will repeat itself. From the Tempe Healing Fields, I'm Belle Maglunog, and I am one with 25. Such healing and generous ways to commemorate 9-11 heroism. That is today's Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Join us tomorrow for stories that matter to you. Visit our website at eaglenews.ph and eaglenewslive.com. Like us on Facebook. Also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash eaglenewsph. On behalf of Eagle News, Washington, D.C., thank you for watching. I am Sarah Nackman, and I am one with you.